I have not seen humans being edged out because of technology. I've seen the demands for some human skill sets changing because of technology. The number one skill set that we wish everybody across every industry and category could have is communication. Even the most data-driven or even the roles that do not require interpersonal relationships, you're still interacting with somebody. And the ability to communicate effectively is a huge demand. I think that human nature is that we like to feel in control and we like to feel valued. Okay, we're here with Deborah Kurtz of Higher Minds. Deborah, welcome to the show. Hi, Drew. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. Hey, what I'd love to do is let's just take a minute. I'd love for you to introduce yourself to the audience and tell us what led you to your role at um, Higher Minds. Yeah, absolutely. So I majored in journalism and spent a lot of time in my younger years crafting stories and learning the art of storytelling. I spent the first 12 years of my career in advertising and I loved that career. I was working primarily in ad tech, ultimately was selling to Fortune 500 consumer brands. However, I interviewed a lot through that part of my career. I spent 12 years doing that and I interviewed a lot for a number of different reasons, ranging from looking for better leadership to looking for better products to looking for where do I feel the most fulfilled. And the interview process really intrigued me. I was confused by it. I didn't understand how companies made decisions. I didn't know what went on behind the scenes. I had one interview that I went six rounds, was waiting on my offer, found out I wasn't getting an offer. And all the things that happened during interviews happened to me over the course of time. And I became very interested in how people hire and why. And I pivoted my career into recruiting about 10 years ago. And in that pivot, I recruit now for companies that essentially are similar or have some regard to the world that I came out of. So it's e-com, it's ad tech, it's marketing, advertising, product. And that's how I landed in, in the world that I'm at. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Just jumping right into this then, there's a lot happening uh, in the economy today. And I think every time that we have things happening in, in this way, it brings to light not, I don't think, new tension in the employee-employee relationship. It's tension that's always there. And this is when I think some people take stock and they're like, I've even gone as far to say the employee-employee relationship is broken in a lot of ways. How do you respond to that statement? The employee-employer relationship is broken. And what do you attribute to your beliefs? I think we have to be careful not to paint with too wide of a brush. I think that every individual person has an individual psychology that impacts how they think, how they work, what drives happiness in the workplace. And I think that companies, while they have one or multiple brands and identities are made up of people as well. And by nature of that, we were dealing with a whole bunch of complexities behind psychology, emotion, behaviors, business, money. Put all of that together. And I think that the notion of the employer is this big thing and the employees are all these individual things. In reality, it's a whole bunch of individual humans working together to try to make it work, whether it is a product or a service. So to say, do I think that it's broken? I think you're going to get a different answer from almost any person you speak to. Mm -hmm. And what I do with a lot of my, I always do with my candidates is one of the questions I ask nearly everybody I work with is, tell me about your definition of success. What does it mean for you to feel successful in your life, in your career? And that answer differs for every single person. And I try to make people comfortable by saying such as for some people, money is their number one driving factor. They will, they are driven to make as much money as they possibly can. For other people, work-life balance is a driving factor. There's no right answer. Help me to understand what, what your definition is. And that definition changes over time and it changes with evolution and it changes with life stage and it changes with age. So I would say I would not agree with that big statement that it's broken. I would say that individuals have to work very hard to understand their definition of success and then to map their journey to get there. 
And that doesn't necessarily happen easily or organically. And really what I love about your response there is there are multiple components. People are going to index on more components, more than others, less than others. And ultimately what we're all trying to do, and I believe that as workers or as just humans, we try to find work that aligns with our values and we want to be with people who share them. So what are some of the things that you work with candidates on or how do you describe here's this is what meaningful work is and here's how to find it? The first thing is that my opinion does not cater to what meaningful work is. That is not like a therapist. That's not they take themselves out of the equation. That's what I do as well. So my definition of meaningful work is going to be my own. Your definition, Drew, is going Absolutely. to Absolutely. So the work that I do is to try to help people put some parameters around that definition. And it doesn't have to be the most complex thing in the world. It may be, I need to pay my bills. That is, maybe that's your definition of success. It may be, I have a passion for this rare disease and I've decided that I'm going to spend my life working towards it. That that may be your definition of success. So this is interesting, Drew. You asked me, how would I go about helping yeah. somebody find success? This is an interesting part of my job in that the recruiter career is often defined as, oh, you help people find jobs. And that's actually not accurate. Recruiters help companies build jobs. And that is something that when I moved into this career was like a light bulb over my head that I did not really understand before my career in recruitment. So when you say to me, how do you help people to find that? I love working with people to help them to identify what might be right for them. And I get truly, I truly get joy out of helping people to say, I'm hearing this, I'm hearing that. That does not really have to do with if I can find a position for them, if I have a position for them that then aligns with what they told me, wonderful. I will call them. I say to people, if I have something that aligns, I'm going to dial your number as fast as my fingers can go. But the way our business actually works is that a company comes to me to say, I need to hire X and Y and Z. And Deb, can you go out and find that person for me? Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a misconception that if a recruiter is not giving a candidate the time and attention that they wish they were, I try to give everybody the time and attention that I would want to receive. But people don't know how recruitment works they don't know how we're compensated and that's something that I always remember like they they don't know recruitment is not a well advertised business it's not really I can dole advice on how to help somebody find their dream job I would love to talk about that all day long absolutely but my actual job is filling positions for companies yeah very well said curious to get your perspective Deborah on what trends are you seeing what are some of the the top skills or competencies and since you've been doing this for over a decade what's that evolution that you've witnessed so Drew the world that I work in is usually with tech companies I do a lot of work with startups or younger companies I do a lot of work with companies that may post a job on LinkedIn and their brand may not mean anything to people so people may not apply. And as far as what trends have I seen, I'm speaking specifically to tech sure. consumer e However, I think what I'm about to say likely may apply throughout all industries, although I'll get that caveat, data-driven responses, tangible examples, walk the walk and talk the talk. Tell me what you've done and why it's important. That is a huge theme. I've done some writing about resume writing. And obviously, I spend a lot of time working with resumes and I help people rewrite their resumes, et cetera. And the biggest thing that I'm seeing that a trend in what employers are looking for is tell me what you have done specifically and tell me the metrics behind it. I work in marketing a lot. That Marketing has shifted from being very creative to being very data-driven. Creative is now an industry as well. So it doesn't mean that creative doesn't exist. But even in creative roles, I encourage candidates to make sure they communicate what did you do and why did it matter? So if a designer built a logo, built a site, I'll ask questions like, and what were the results? What kind of traffic did you have before you overhauled the site? What kind of traffic did you have after you overhauled the site? And this is my trying to help. I'm not quizzing them on the right answer. I'm trying to help them to say, 
this is what I did and why it was relevant and why it was important and why it ultimately drove benefits for the business. So that's a huge trend is talking about what you did, why it was important and why it impacted the business and how that skill set can make you successful in your next job. So data, that's probably nothing new, but data, another trend, remote work, hybrid, remote, in office, that's not even a trend anymore now that we're three years into yeah. it, but it's a mm-hmm. white, white, hot, emotionally charged, polarizing issue. I'm not sure if I have enough factual data to tell you what the trends are, but we see attitudes shifting. We continue to see attitudes shifting and changing both from the employer side and the employee side. So that's an interesting ongoing impact of the pandemic. And it's a very emotionally charged issue. Sure. Are you seeing anything more, whether it's roles that didn't once rely on it, but maybe like communication or subjective decision-making or things of that nature? I will say that in terms of, am I seeing any new skill sets come into other roles that are priorities? I actually had an interesting conversation the other day in which a group of us said the number one skill set that we wish everybody across every industry and category could have is communication. Mm. Even the most data-driven or even the roles that do not require interpersonal relationship, you're still interacting with somebody. And the ability to communicate effectively is a huge demand. We've seen it more in highly technical roles Mm -hmm. that the ability to communicate, which again, anecdotally, a few years in may have been a little bit more overlooked. This is a high tech position. So we're not looking for excellent communication skills, especially if people are working in different environments now, such as remote, the communication skills and being able to connect with each other transparently, whether you're in an office or you're across different states has become a priority. Yeah. Going down this vein of communication or those more like human skills on this show, we talk about that phenomenon, right? That as machines continue to take on the more transactional or objective components of work, humans are left to tackle the more relational or subjective components. And so even right now, today, we're experiencing major disruption in work with AI, chat, GPT. In your view, what are humans left to do in a world proliferated by robots, automation, and AI? In my view, in a world where AI and robots and automation is having a heavier hand, I think that the human hand is even more important. An example that I'll share is around the enormous frustration from candidates who are applying for jobs and they spend 45 minutes applying for a job and they get an automatic reply, thank you for your application, you're not qualified. I feel, we've all experienced it. I yeah. We we all have. I would advise to that, whatever company it is that engenders that response, is give it 48 hours, give it two days, and then engender the response. The immediate rejection is like a huge peak in the shift. Humanizing experiences, it's wonderful that we can automate things. It's wonderful we can get them off our plates so that we as humans can spend time doing things that we deem as more relevant. However, I think the most important thing is that we as humans make sure that we are giving human experience. Bringing it to my industry in terms of candidate application, we know the hiring process is also another highly emotional issue. We know that the more hands-on high-touch approach that you can offer, the better candidates feel. We know that it is not realistic or productive for every company to reject every candidate with a conversation. I remember some years ago, I don't know if HubSpot is still doing this, but I remember that they rolled out an offering that I think it was any candidate or maybe it was somebody who went multiple rounds or some stipulation, but they would give real-time feedback as to why that person didn't get hired. And it was highly applauded. And I think that's amazing. I think it's impossible for a lot of companies to do that. It's just impossible for a lot of variety of different reasons, ranging from logistics to sensitivities to the list goes on. But what I would advise, again, talking about my industry in terms of automation is automate what does not involve emotion. If we can automate scheduling, here's my Calendly, that's great. No, no emotion in that. But where let's just use that as an example. Where emotion comes in is when they say, sure, put them on my Calendly for an interview. And the first available interview, the first available time slot is two weeks away. 
Mm. Then that doesn't. So then I go back and say, I see you're booked for two weeks. Is that accurate? Do you have any openings? That's where the automation breaks down and you need the human touch. I really advise in hiring interview processes, all of that, try to add the human component when it is practical, when it is realistic. And then as people, as consumers, as candidates, as everyday people, I think we also have to have a little bit of an understanding that we're in business and we're trying to get jobs and we're trying to hire and it's awful going through it. If you're getting rejected or you don't get the job that you want, it's awful. It doesn't mean that you're an awful person. It doesn't mean it's not going to work out next time. It doesn't necessarily mean you did something wrong or you said something wrong. I see that a lot. That's behind the scenes that I see a lot that if we have four or five, six candidates, it's not that five of them did something wrong. It might be that one of them had a quality or an experience that was a differentiator. Yeah, sure. That makes a lot of sense. And I love the point you made about automate what doesn't have emotion, right? And humanize those components that do, that definitely resonates. Shifting conversation a little bit to the rise, right? That I think was happening well before the pandemic, freelance, fractional work, but now it's accelerated. Maybe the pendulum has swung a little too far. And in your space, curious to get your perspective on this. Do you think it's possible to build a company 100% on freelance or fractional workers? Sure, of course. Yes, I think that any company can build things in any way that is in accordance to what they want. I absolutely see small companies that have sole proprietors that have no employees and they outsource the work that they can't handle on their own, whether that be creative or administrative or whatever it may yeah. be. Sure. Do I see that being the trend? I don't really know. I think my short answer is I think it will probably come down to finances. And that's usually what I see. Is it more expensive to outsource it or is it more effective to have it in-house? We have seen some shifts in, we do a lot of work with agencies, ad agencies, consultancies, digital, and we've seen some pendulum shifts in terms of bringing things in-house there's been a huge demand put back on the agencies, actually. The agencies are booming right mm. now, whereas a couple of years ago, there was a trend to bring things in-house. So we do see these pendulum shifting. I would say, yes, of course, a company can, and lots of companies do run that way. I guess at my first glance, most of them I see tend to be small, and outsourcing is a way to, to get what they need without needing right. somebody on staff. But sure, I love the idea. Great. Thank you for that perspective. One of the things that we are seeing because of the higher prevalence of freelance and fractional work is that I really think it seems to be paving the way for revolutionizing contracts and contracting between the employer and the employee. Upwork announced earlier this year that they're now allowing companies to do full-time contracts on their platform, making it easier than ever to hire contract workers. At the same time in the news, because of what's happening in the economy, I think we're seeing a lot of more activity on union buzz and right. What do you think all of this says about at will employment, at least here in the US? Oh, it's so interesting. There's another layer that I would add to that, Drew, about at will employment, which is that many of us get our health insurance through our employers. So yes. That's a super interesting layer. I think that human nature is that we like to feel in control and we like to feel valued. Yes. And I think those are two core assets to most humans. I've met very few humans who have ever said, I love to feel like I'm not appreciated. I am not sure if contract freelance is the means to an end or if the bigger issue is around how to make the employer and employee relationship genuinely strong. I think that there are a lot of means to ends to make that relationship strong. And I think that you could talk to a lot of different people who want a lot of different things. The contracting and freelance, I probably see a handful of people a year who have been working for my clients or working for tech companies who decide to start their own business and their freelance businesses. And usually there are things within creative or marketing. So I do see that. The number one negative that I hear about people doing it is they so often come back to me and say, it's great, but it's really hard to win business. I spend a lot of time trying to get business, which is not what they want to be doing. They want to be doing their creative art or their marketing. So that's one negative that I see is building a business in the biz dev part of it. And then the people that do it and do it well, they love it. They love the independence. They love the freedom. They love the flexibility. I think like anything, Drew, there's some of us who want to work in an office or some of us who want to be work with colleagues or some of us who want 
all the things that a company can bring, such as training and L and D and et cetera. And then there are some people who want other things and pros and cons come with all of it. But I do think that one of the most massive core messages that we're seeing is that we want to be valued. You made a comment, human nature is that we like to feel in control and appreciated. And I think that kind (laughs) of hit the nail on the head there. You're in a unique position where you're trying to help companies, right? Fill these positions, as you said. Ultimately, what these companies are, are inherently saying is a human in this role is going to create value of some kind. How would you help someone process what is the value of a human in the work context? So I guess just to talk that up for a minute, I guess we're asking the question as to if there was a technology that could automate something or if there is a human, which is a better option. And the first thing that comes to mind for me is the self-checkout line at the supermarket. And the next thing that comes to mind for me is I would always go to the human rather than the self-checkout. The reason for that is that the self-checkout for me always goes wrong. I'm always the one raising the hand being like, move that. So that may be a flaw on my behalf. It may be a flaw in the technology. Hard to say where why I'm driven that way. The choice of human versus automation will come down to we live in a capitalistic society. I think money will make a huge difference. And I think quality of work will make a huge difference. I think quality of work is probably the number one driver. Automating something, but the work product is poor, is not a solution. It's how I feel about the self-checkout lines. Yeah. Oh we're open, there's only two people, I'll wait in line for the person because the product for me in the self-checkout lines often is not effective. It's more frustrating. Some of this is anecdotal in terms of what I see, but I have not seen humans being edged out because of technology. I've seen the demands for some human skill sets changing because of technology. Ah. Ability to optimize certain program, the ability to know which programs work well and to choose them. Integration of technology is a huge thing that I don't spend a lot of time in in my life, but there are people out there who lives are integrating technology. So I think those factors start to come into play when evaluating technology is how seamless are these things. Again, I'm just one person. I have not seen, nobody has knocked on my door that I can remember to say, I am no longer relevant because technology has changed. I do remember 25, maybe 30 years ago, I do remember when monster.com launched. I had a family member who was in recruitment and I do remember her saying, oh my God, Monster is going to eat our business. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be in business anymore. And it is now about 30 years later and I'm in recruitment. I followed in her footsteps and we do still have a business. And what monster.com did was it changed the business. It, It just changed it. Maybe it made it better. Maybe it made it worse. I'm not sure. I wasn't in the business at the time when Monster launched, but it changed it. I would never say that it eroded it or that maybe it helped it. But I think our view on technology is the self-driving cars, like the Teslas, like they do the car. Absolutely. Send the car to the supermarket. I don't see a lot of, I don't see a lot of my world. Okay. AI taking over. Got it. Yeah. Cool. So let's talk about career development for a second. Maybe for our audience I'd love to get your perspective because you have this, these relationships with the business. A lot of career development services are subsidized by the business. Could you maybe just share with the audience what sort of career development programs businesses may be offering candidates and employees these days? It really varies. I said in the beginning of this conversation, let's not let's be careful not to paint with too wide of a brush, of but course. I do exactly that, which is stereotypically. I tend to see the large companies have very regimented training programs and have very formulaic. You learn this and then you learn this. And if you're talented enough, we'll put you into this track and they have a very organized career path. And then for smaller or younger startup companies, lots of times I'll say to a candidate who's interviewing with a startup, if they say, so what's the career path from here? And I say, nobody knows. You can ask them. We don't know. If you do this job for 18 months and you do, the question is going to come right back to you. But what do you want to do from here? What would be progressive for you? And depending on who you are and how you're wired, different companies and different options and different environments are good, bad, and otherwise. I think that if I was going to put a stake in the ground, Drew, to say what's the number one thing that companies can or should be doing for career development and education, the number one thing I would say is to let there be some form of self-driven, self-fulfilling prophecy around education. Being told you need to learn this. This is why school is 
a problem for many people. Being told you need to learn this is usually just like we said, people like to be in control. You need to learn this to do your job. So we're going to put you in a two-day training session for it. People inherently don't like that. What they do like is to say, I'm currently in this role and what I am interested in doing moving forward is I'd like to get better at X and Y and I'd like to do education on it. And I think large companies have resources to do that. Small companies can do it too. We're so lucky in our world today that education is at our fingertips. Yeah. You know, that it wasn't even 15 years ago, even 10 years ago. I think if a company can applaud, one of the things I love when I see on companies that I work with or job descriptions is continuing education. And it it might be a stipend. It doesn't even have to be expensive. It might be a little bit of money annually to put towards continuing ed. And if I see that, I love it because it says to our candidates, we want to invest in you. And it doesn't have to be, I know a lot of companies can't do can't afford to do many things like that. It doesn't have to be many things. It can be, right. it's just pushing in the right direction to say, we applaud everyone continuing to learn and grow. Absolutely. So to wrap up our conversation today in this career development track, and you start off by saying like one of your revelations getting into recruitment is that we don't work uh, with the candidates to help them find jobs. We work with the businesses to help them fill jobs. And we talk to candidates to do that. And just as that is the business is the primary beneficiary of those services, career development very much is the business is the primary beneficiary and that they're subsidizing it for the employee. And we're in an economy right now where it's almost, I shouldn't have to pay for this myself. My business has to pay it for me. That can lead to pigeonholing of careers, career tracks, right? If you're only going to what they will fun because you may never explore or find something out about yourself that couldn't be subsidized. Do you think we'll start to see a trend, especially as we see much more in the freelance and fractional space and people taking control over their careers? Do you think we could potentially see more workers subsidized career development services in the future? I see companies putting it more into the hands of the employer. I don't mean to not take a stand on it. I, again, think it's really going to depend on who the company is and what their missions and what their philosophies are, how much resources they have that they have. Yeah. But if I was going to give anyone advice on furthering themselves, yes. my advice would be that the days are very far long gone than when you go and work for a company for 30 years that's extraordinarily behind us. The days of a pension, the days of depending on your employer for long-term growth and success we're just not in that world. And most of the people who we're talking to right now has never been in that world. What I would say is that we're in a wonderful time of accessibility. The amount of education that exists at our fingertips that is not necessarily expensive is so amazing. And I do think as hard as it is to change industries or positions or not be pigeonholed, and it is, pigeonholing is a bigger issue than I think any of us realize upon walking into our careers. However, I love working with candidates who have told me their stories about I was doing this and then I put myself on this path and I got myself an education doing it. And those educations absolutely do not need to be funded by expensive private colleges. They don't need to be funded by taking time off. I know getting an education while you're working is very challenging, but there are ways that you can do it with flexibility, with carving time out, So yes, pursue those educations. There are so many opportunities out there. They do not have to be too expensive and they do not have to erode um, your full-time work. And I do think employers are appreciative of somebody who demonstrates that they challenge themselves. They keep themselves growing and learning versus somebody who says, I wanted to learn about this, but I didn't have time or the resources. Yeah. Employers love, what does an employer love? We love somebody who pushes themselves, of course. Right. Yes, it's all out there. It doesn't have to be the fanciest class in the world. Yeah, that's great. And in a way, it benefits both, right? If you're out looking out for your own career, educating yourself, businesses love to see that too. Deborah, it was an absolute pleasure to get to speak with you today. Is there anything in wrapping up here that you'd like to share with the audience that maybe I didn't touch on? I suppose the last thing I would say is job searching. And we happen to be in a moment where there are a lot of people doing it. Job searching is really hard. And I just ask people to just hang on, just keep doing it another day. It is oftentimes people ask me, what did I do wrong? 
or why didn't they choose me? And so many times it's not that you did anything wrong. It's not that you're missing something. It's about finding a match. And so much of it is timing and circumstance and the right thing at the right time with the right place. Yeah. And there was no dream job and there was no one job for one person. There's not, there will be, a, there are many fish in the sea. There will be another one. And I think that's a message that I would love to share with people is don't give too much credit to any one chance. There will be others. I promise. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's very inspirational. I think, especially to a lot of people in today's market. Awesome. Deborah, thank you so much. Thank you, Drew.